All right, Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> now let me review and then explain verse by verse and word for word. Remember, Abram fell into a deep sleep and then a great darkness fell on him. And in this great darkness, the Lord spoke to him a prophecy that his people and his seed, they're, they're going to be strangers in a land and they're going to suffer affliction. And also that they will be able to eventually leave and return to their land. And the gap is about 400 years for the affliction and for sojourning in a strange land was longer, 430 years. When we calculate it through history, that does not match. So it seems like there's a contradiction in your Bible. However, the contradiction was resolved where the 400 years was referring to the affliction of Abram's seed. So that's not just solely Egyptians. The affliction that Abram's seed received started with Ishmael. All right. Ever since Ishmael, all the other non-Jewish people or the, the foreigners or outsiders that persecuted Abram's seed has continued on for 400 years. The 430 years is referring to Abram's seed sojourning uh, in a land that is not theirs. And that's not referring to solely Egypt. That's referring to their entirety of sojourning in a land that's not theirs. So when it started with Abram, Abram, when he moved to the land, the Lord promised he would give him the land, but it did not fully belong to him yet. He's the sojourner. For some of you who didn't know, Abram and his descendants, they were, want, uh, they were nomads. They uh, were sojourners. They didn't live permanently. The land did not permanently belong to them. So that's what resolved the contradiction, and we're continuing that prophecy. So God is continuing his prophecy, and that will be at verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. So God is speaking here that the nation, now remember God is referring to this generally. So he's not thinking specifically solely Egypt. Egypt is inclusive here. So remember that. When God says about the nation that they're going to be sojourners or anything that has to do with the singular plot of land or singular reference to this, remember that it's referring to generally. It's referring to generally... the outsiders uh, with the land that they're residing, that they were sojourning. So we'll just say Gentiles. That would be simpler to say. Generally Gentiles that they were residing under, which means then Egypt will be included here, obviously. So remember, it's not solely Egypt. It's including Egypt. That way, this prophecy has no contradictions and actually it works beautifully. Let's keep reading. So he's going to judge, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 14 says, referring to that nation that the Abram's descendants or Jews are residing, they're going to serve them, which is very true. We've seen that the Jews later on, they were serving Egypt. So remember, this is Egypt included, right? So that prophecy will still work. The Jews were under slavery and bondage under the Egyptians. Remember, when God gives a prophecy, he's not thinking about one specific time period or even one group of people. Sometimes he'll include two or three different persons and, and talk, cover two to three different timelines in one prophecy. Remember, that's, God, that's how prophecy works. And by the way, this is common sense in prophecy. I would even dare say nearly all denominations will even have to agree with that interpretation. Because when you study God's prophecy, you cannot solely fit it to one person and one timeline. You can fit to two different uh, timelines with two different persons. The book of Revelation is the easiest evidence. The book of Psalms is another easy evidence. Uh, here's the simplest example. The first and second coming of Christ. 
The Bible never said first and second coming, guys. Yeah, right. Because we're dispensationalists, we divided it that way. Yeah. But if you look at the prophecies, it's Jesus' first coming and second coming meshed into one. Mm -hmm. When God gave prophecies in the Bible, he meshed it together. Sometimes he'll flip them over. Right, right. Second coming can go first, first coming next. Yeah. That's how prophecy works. Why? Because remember, God is I am that I am. So he's not bound by time or boundaries. So he can go everywhere, anywhere he wants to. Yep. That's how God works. Now, if we understand that, let's continue Genesis chapter 15. So this is including Egypt. They're going to serve the Egyptians under slavery. God says, will I judge? So God's going to judge the Egyptians whom the Israelites are going to serve as slaves. And we know that at the book of Exodus that did happen. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. After God frees them and judges the Egyptians, the Jews are going to come out of the land of Egypt with a lot of riches, great possessions, great substance. Let's see this prophecy fulfilled at Exodus 12. Notice how Exodus 12 worded it. Exodus chapter 12. Notice that Moses mentions about the prophecy that God gave to Abram. He partially includes that there. He partially mentions about the prophecy God gave to Abram in this chapter when the Jews left. The Egyptians, we know they got judged by the Lord with the ten plagues in Egypt and that the Jews, when they left the land of Egypt, the Egyptians gave them so many riches and they left the land with great substance. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, verse 36, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. They took a lot of spoils out of them. Verse 40, this kind of sounds a little bit like Genesis 15 that we read. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 400 and 30 years, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So notice right here that this is a prophecy being fulfilled. I just want to make sure if they got all the audio, they didn't skip anything. Okay, then let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 15. Now, remember, I'm not going to explain that uh, apparent contradiction that you see at Exodus 12. We already covered that last chance to study, so I won't cover that here. So I don't want some onliners to be immature and post a comment there. You see, there's a contradiction right here. This doesn't make sense. Go back to our previous Genesis study, please. The reason why, I know that I don't have to say that, but you'd be surprised I have to say that because a lot of people who watch us online, they don't pay attention to what I'm saying. So unless I point them out, then they start to pay attention. Unfortunately, uh, that's how life goes in the techno technology world. Let's go back to Genesis 15. Let's go to verse 15. <clears throat> and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. So God says to Abram that he's going to be able to pass away and join his forefathers peaceably. So he's going to die in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So Abram's going to die in a good old age. So that's what's going to happen to him. But what's going to happen within the fourth generation? Look at verse 16. But in the fourth generation, whatever that is, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Okay, so let me explain that. <clears throat> whatever this means, God is saying that in the fourth generation, whatever that is, right? Whatever this fourth generation is, and when this occurs, at the same time, they, whoever they are, are going to return to the land again. That's what it says, right? So they're going to return to the land again. So it's pretty apparent then, if it's talking about the context of Abram, that he's going to die in a good old age, and God 
God's focus throughout the whole time was this land, Canaan. So, basically, they're going to return to Canaan again. So this land is called Canaan. All right. So they are going to return to Canaan again at the fourth generation. So let's go one by one. Who is this fourth generation talking about? How we can know who this fourth generation is, is finding out the they first. Once you find out they, then you're going to find out who that fourth generation is. So they is referring to the Amorites. How do you know that? Because it's simple. You just read the verse as it says. If you read the verse as it says, the context will show you who they is. Notice who's the closest context to they. The iniquity of the Amorites. Why would God mention that part? Why would God mention about those people? Because that's the attention of this verse. So the Amorites are going to return. When? During the fourth generation. But I'm also going to give another possibility. And I think more people will agree with this interpretation they can also refer to the Jews. The reason why is because it's not just this verse. If you look at the whole passage, the whole passage is about Abram's seed. So either or you can go. Now, if we understand that this is what they is referring to, then we can guess who that fourth generation is. The fourth generation will have to refer to the Jews then. Within the Jews' fourth generation, they'll be able to return to the land. Okay, now, the question is this. If it's referring to the fourth generation of Jews, obviously it's not referring to Abram. After Abram, then the next generation, next, next. No, that's not how it works. If you read the Bible, the Jews, it took a lot of generations after Abram till they finally returned to the land of Canaan. So, the point is this. The Jews return to Canaan, right? So, when did they return to Canaan? Well, when they returned to Canaan was obviously, let's put another line here. When they returned to Canaan, it was, uh, let me put it this way. That way this thing doesn't block it. We know it's when Moses went there, Correct. Okay, it's when Moses went there. So we know it's referring to Moses' generation. Well, if we know it's referring to Moses' generation, then all we have to do is go backwards. So then 4, 3, 2, 1. Then we'll find out what that fourth generation is. And then we're going to understand later on why God said fourth generation. Let's go to Exodus 6. <clears throat> Exodus 6. Exodus 6, let's go backwards. Exodus chapter 6. And then I want you to look at verse 20. Verse 20. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20. Notice how the generation pattern goes. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20. The Bible says, And Amram took him Jochebed, his father's sister to wife, and she bare him Aaron and who? Moses. Okay, so we know Moses. Now let's go backwards. Who uh, gave birth, uh, who, uh, whose son, whose lineage did Moses came from? Amram, right? Where did I put that? Oh, here you are. Okay. So he came from Amram. Let's go backwards here. So if we're going to go fourth generation, and it's going to start with Moses, let's also draw an arrow this way. That way people can follow along here. All right, here's how the generation goes. So first, Moses, that's four. Backwards, Amram. Can we agree so far? All right. Like I told you, don't look at me like a tree full of owls. Look at that Bible. You're going to get lost if you don't read that book, okay? The way that how I explain is by the verse, okay? That's how you're going to follow along with me. Sometimes my explanations can find it, can 
sound repetitive or awkward, but the reason why is because I'm trying to go by the verse and for you to look at the verse and you can follow along my logic and flow here, okay? All right, we agree Amram is three. All right, what's two? Go backwards. We're going to go at verse 18, 18. And the sons of Koath, Amram. See that? So Koath is the one that was responsible for Amram being born. So then that's two. Then one, Levi. Let's go backwards again. Keep reading. Levi was the one responsible for Kohath being born. Verse 16, 16. And these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon and Kohath. You see that? So then it's from Levi. Now, notice one is this. One, we know the attention is on Moses. If the attention is on Moses, go back to Genesis 15, right? If we go back to uh, and keep your hand over there at Exodus, and I want you to compare and contrast, just kind of see through it, just glimpse through it. You don't have to read it, just glimpse through it. Okay, Genesis 15, God says fourth generation, correct? Yeah. All right, who is he seeing? He's seeing Moses here, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so he's seeing Moses right here. If he's seeing Moses, then... When Moses is being discussed, do you think God's going to, uh, let's say we jump to the Exodus timeline. When God jumps to the Exodus timeline and Moses is being referred to, do you think that God is going to think back about what he prophesied about fourth generation? Yes, he will, right? Okay, then in Exodus chapter 6, here's the idea. Moses is mentioned and he's mentioning about generation here. Now, when he's mentioning about generation, what do you think he'll have in mind? Yeah. This one. Yeah. Right. When you read this passage, ever since Israel, you jump down four generations. So this is no doubt when God is, taught, when God is speaking Exodus 6 about the generations, in God's mind, he's thinking about that prophecy at Genesis 15. Amen. All right, do we follow along? Because, look, guys, this is very random. Why would he all of a sudden mention generations in Exodus 6? If you read Exodus 4, 5, 6, and onward, it's talking about the story of Moses going into Egypt, conquering Pharaoh, but then all of a sudden in the middle of the story, God says, and by the way, the generation of so-and-so and the generation of so-and-so, and people are like, oh, why would God say that? Because God's trying to remind you. Remember that prophecy I gave at Genesis 15? It's being fulfilled. So that's what God means by fourth generation. But also, if you go back to Genesis 15, we're kind of a little bit of a dummy. We would have caught this. It already gave the answer at verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall what? Come hither again. They will return to Canaan. Why? Abram was in Canaan all that time. So was Isaac. So was Israel, Jacob. So... They shall return hither again, fourth generation, obviously does not mean from Abram, Isaac, uh, Israel, Jacob to Levi. No, that's not what it means. They were already living in here. That's good, brother. It's talking about when they return to Israel, when they return to Canaan. So we have to start out with the generation that was away from Israel. We have to start from there. And by the fourth generation, they're going to return to the land. All right, then that fits well. Who is it? Well, it doesn't start with Jacob or, or Israel because he was in Canaan. It has to start with Levi, his son. Then it goes to uh, Kohath, Amram, Moses. Ding, it fits well. All right, now we understand what that is referring to. The next part of verse 16, the second half, we don't understand. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Okay, basically God's saying the Jews have to, what we understand, the Jews have to return to Canaan with Moses. Why? The Bible says because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What that is meaning is this. It's like an hourglass. So it's like an hourglass that God is saying that the Amorites, they've committed a sin. So because of their sin that they committed... 
that their time is almost full or up, so to speak. That's the idea. Their time is almost up. And so because their time is almost up, that will be when the Amorites get judged. And that is true. If you know the story of Moses and the children of Israel, when they enter Canaan, the Amorites get judged. Joshua and the Jews, Moses' people, they all conquer and slaughter the Amorites. So God is judging the Amorites for their sin. That's why God prophesied that when the Jews return back to their land in Canaan, it's, they're going to be judging the Amorites because of their sin. Now, there's a particular reason why God mentioned Amorite here. He didn't just put a bunch of Canaanites. Amorite, out of all the people in Canaan, is mentioned. Do you know why? I don't know if you caught this before. Abram, when he was living in Canaan, the Bible says the land belonged to an Amorite. Yep. That's why. If you recall back at Genesis 14, all right, Genesis 14, if you recall Genesis 14 and verse 13, Genesis 14, 13, notice that, remember? See, Abram's living in that land. Remember, the whole idea, the whole subject is about the land of Canaan. Abram, you're going to inherit it. Yeah. That's why he mentions the Amorite here. Because why? Because Abram is residing with an Amorite. Yeah. And God's saying it's not going to belong to them, it's going to belong to you. So that's the reason why God mentioned it that way. Amen. So it's like an hourglass. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It's referring to a timeline. Until their cup gets full over here, so it's right here, but once it reaches right here to the fullness, then God's like, okay, time's up. Now the Jews return to the land of Canaan. You had your chance to repent, to get right. I was merciful to you for a long time. And now that you've sinned so much and you reached my limit, Time's up. The hourglass is full. This is, the sand is referring to their sin. So it's referring to the sin. And the sin is being filled up. And once it's full, then God's like, okay, time's up now. Now it, your judgment comes. Here comes Moses' people, and they're going to wipe you guys out. That's the idea. Now, there are two passages to show this interpretation. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 2. And Romans 11 is 1 Thessalonians 2 and Romans 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Romans 11. And I want you to look at that whiteboard and then remember how I explained to you. That way when we look at these verses, it's going to click. It's going to click easily. Okay? Let's look at Romans 11 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to go ahead and read now. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15. 15. This is talking about the Jews. The Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. To what? Fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Now look at this. So the Lord, it's like he's putting up with their sin. Yeah. Yeah. And it's reaching a limit point here. Yeah. But their sin is being, the Bible says, filling up. Yeah. So notice that it matches well with that picture. Look at Romans 11. Romans 11. Because you got to recall that during the Old Testament time, when people pictured time, it's not like the clock on the wall you see. They use hourglasses. So this will fit very well when God's talking about some kind of time limit. So if you picture it that way, it's going to make sense, these verses. Let's look at Romans chapter 11. Notice at verse 25. 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until... ah. So God is saying the Jews are blinded, but the, until there's a specific time period, until this time period is up, until 
the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So notice right here, God is seeing a time period as fullness. So something is being filled up. So this makes a lot of sense. So this matches very, very well. Let's go back to Genesis 15. That's what the verse means. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Meaning that the Amorites' sins is not full yet. See, it's still down here. It's not full yet. So they still have time. That's why I'm going to... That's why that verse is saying, I'm going to give them till that fourth generation when Moses is going to come in. And then it's going to be full and time is up for them. Wow. All right, let's go back to Genesis 15. Are we still next to the six? Uh, no, uh, you can let go of Exodus 6. Sorry about that. Thank you. All right, go back to Genesis 15. The Bible says, and it came to pass. So remember, that's a favorite phrase we saw so far, meaning what happened next. It just so happened that when the sun went down and it was dark, that when the sun was going down and it be became dark, okay, already I see a contradiction already in Scripture. Why would the Bible say uh, the sun went down and it became dark when already he said that at verse 12? Verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Okay, but it gets worse. The sun was already down and it was dark. When you go backwards at verse 5, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. Why? There's a contradiction in your Bible. I told you so. I point out three contradictions. Notice in Genesis 15, it's a great passage where you can find contradictions. I've already explained several of them so far. Now, here's another contradiction you will find. Now, the answer is actually simple. The simple answer is uh, ver chapter 15 and verse 5, when God told Abram to look at the stars, this was in a vision at verse 1. See? Verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. See? So this happened in a vision. What happened... We know that Abram, he was separating uh, the pieces of animals. We studied that. And the Bible says the sun was going down and it became dark. So this is, outside, uh, this is outside of that vision or supernatural realm this time. This is real life. When did that occur? It's possible that uh, if you read the structure of the text, if you read it, then you can tell that it could probably be verse 7. Verse 7, it's like God is speaking again to him. That's what we see. Or, or it could be that it happened at verse 10, verse 10, that God was telling Abram to take these pieces of animal, and then when he got out of the vision, he started to take the animal pieces and divide them. So that's what would have happened. That's very possible. Now, when we go back to this passage. What about this part? In verse 12, sun went down and darkness came. And then at verse 17, sun went down and darkness came. Well, that's not what it's, it's not pointing out two separate events. It's pointing out the same thing that happened. Because let's read this one by one. Verse 12, when the sun's going down, verse 12, darkness came. And then to be when darkness came, God gave a prophecy at verse 13 through 16. Now, that's only four verses. The sun's not going to go down and get dark within four verses. All right? You kidding me? It's not going to go down in two minutes and then you're done. All right? It's on that process of going down and becoming dark. So God was speaking. But if you read verse 17, you would have caught that. And it came to pass that Look at this. When the sun went down and it was dark. Yeah. So it's continuing yeah, it's what, uh, that process yeah. that it was talking about at verse 12, that when the sun was going down and it became dark. Wow. Okay? Yeah. All right, let's go back <coughs> at verse 17. Verse 17. So when the sun went down, you can see this uh, beautiful artwork of pink. If you knew what that meant, that's the sun going down, if you realize what that was. <laughs> All right. So when the, yeah, wow, all right, don't mock me. All right, so when the sun was, when the sun was, 
going down and it's becoming dark, this is where you see in this picture, the Bible says, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So remember these animal pieces he divided. The Bible says a burning lamp and a smoking furnace. Now, this is very interesting, the wording. How Dr. Uckman mentioned this was he said, a furnace does not uh, show light and then a burning light uh, or, or a light does not uh, sh uh, give uh, uh, sense heat. So that's pretty interesting how he worded it that way. So then the Lord is showing you two separate things that's going on over here. Why would he make that distinction? There's a meaning. Remember, the Lord, with the Lord, there's a meaning behind everything. The key is that prophecy. That prophecy is about the Jews, remember, that they're sojourners under the Gentiles and that they'll be enslaved by the Gentiles and be afflicted by the Gentiles. And that they're then they're going to come out of the Gentile land and be able to uh, possess the land of Canaan. If we remember that prophecy, these pictures that God gave to Abraham is going to click and make sense. Go to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 20, verse 20. Notice that when the Jews came out of the land of Egypt, out of the affliction and bondage of Egypt, God says that that's referring to the furnace. Deuteronomy 4.20. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the what? Iron furnace, even out of Egypt. That's what Egypt's referring to. The burning lamp could be referring to Isaiah 62. But Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62, the burning lamp is referring to the Jews being basically saved or restored in some way, restored and saved in some way. That's what the burning lamp is referring to. Look at Isaiah chapter 62, verse 1, for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Oh, okay, then this will make sense. The idea is, the meaning is, when the Jews suffer affliction in Egypt, that's the furnace. They've been tried by fire. They go through the fire and they come out. And when they come out, they come out shining like a bright lamp. And that represents their salvation, their restored state. Why, that picture's a lot like Christians going through a trial by fire, but then they come out shining like gold, bright, bright, uh, brightening up. So that's a good picture uh, of Christians going through trial by fire and shining for the Lord. Then why is it between the pieces? Because the pieces don't get burned. They go through the fire, but the, but, they don't, uh, but the fire don't touch them. They don't get burned. Amen. You know what that, those Amen. pieces are referring to? Why, these are innocent animals. Right. Remember the Jews, when they offered up sacrifices of these innocent animal pieces, animals represented them, their sins, yeah. their deeds. Yeah, right. the, if we think about what God called church members, he called them sheep. Yeah. See? So this picture is us. And then here comes Egypt, the wicked world, that iron furnace, but it's passing between the pieces. Wow. I mean, we're, we can feel that heat and it's, it's feel like getting scorched, but it's not to the point where we burn and get consumed. Yeah. Amen. We endure through the fire, and guess what? We come forth shining brightly Amen. for the Lord. Amen. That's what this beautiful picture illustrates, what the Lord's trying to show to Abram. Okay, go back. Genesis 15. Genesis chapter 15. There's a lot of meaning behind the vision and the prophecy when God is speaking to Abram. Let's go back to Genesis 15, verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, so at that same day when all this happened, God, is, God makes a covenant with Abram. He says to him, this is a covenant. This is repetitive of Genesis 12, Genesis 13, 
and Genesis 15, the land grant to the Jews. And I already gave, gave, uh, gave you the details, the boundary lines of the land grant. I'm not going to do it again. This is very plain. Unto thy seed, Abram's seed. And I already proved by the context of Genesis 15, you have to put the physical nation of Israel here. You can't just say that the physical nation of Israel, that they've been cast aside and the Christians replaced them. No, I've proven that you have to have the physical nation of Israel here. Right. Now, taking that assumption to Abram's physical children, his seed, God says, I gave the land, so the land of Canaan to the Jews. What's the boundary lines? From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. From, so that's a huge land grant. All the way from the start of the river from Egypt to the great river, the gr river Euphrates. And here's a detail of the land. Who resides in this land? The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims. So those are, remember, those uh, descendants, those mutations from fallen angels. And the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. I'm not going to describe these people because it was already told to you. Uh, Genesis chapter 10 was where uh, it was discussed to you from Ham lines, then Canaan's line. Mm -hmm. See, Canaan, that's the land Canaan, named after him. Mm -hmm. So his people, descendants, were already mentioned in my commentary at Genesis 10. These groups of people within this land is already explained at Genesis 14 that I told you. Remember, that's the best, probably, chapter to get an idea and a picture of how the land terrain looks like for the Jews right. is Genesis 14. Because remember, those four kings were conquering all these people. And the people that they were conquering was that entire region of Canaan. Now imagine, God says, Abram, what those four kings were conquering, that whole entire plot of land is yours. That's the idea. And I showed you that the terrain that those four kings were conquering at Genesis 14 matched with Deuteronomy 2. So I gave you that commentary at Genesis 14. So I'm not going to repeat it right here. That is the perfect, if you want a picture and a map of, of what it looks like, my commentary on Genesis 14 best illustrated that. I gave you a map and I showed you how it went. Okay, let's look at Genesis 16 now. Genesis 16. <clears throat> Here we go. All right, the ugly thing that happened, that, that messed up all of history. Genesis 16.1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, named, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So Sarai, uh, I'm going to explain every word. That way you can understand what every word means in the verse. So pay attention to how I explain it. So Sarai is Abram's wife, right? She couldn't bring forth any children for Abram. But you know what? She had a handmaid. Uh, so she had a uh, servant girl, a slave, an Egyptian. So you can guess where she got that Egyptian from. Remember, Pharaoh gave Abram and Sarai a bunch of slaves. So that's where they got their slaves or their servants. So Hagar is the Egyptian's name. And Sarai said to Abraham... Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. So Sarai is saying, look. So that's what behold now means, remember. So look, uh, God has shut up basically my womb. I'm not able to bring forth children to you. So now she automatically makes an assumption what God's will is. That's dangerous. Yeah. I pray thee. Now notice right here that she's pleading with him, begging with him. Now, Normally, now sometimes this doesn't happen, I'm sure, but I, this does generally happen. If a woman pleads with you, it's kind of hard for a husband to turn that one down, uh, generally speaking. If some of you husbands are like, what? No, I, she don't tell me what to do. She can beg me all she wants. I'm going to say no. Well, from what I'm seeing today, I, I don't really think so. From what I read the Bible, if a woman gives that, you know, that pitiful side, you know, and then the weakness of that man is that woman, actually. That's why the devil went to Eve, and that's why with Eve giving the fruit to Adam, that's why Adam fell for it. So I don't know how it's like in your family tree, but generally that's how it works in the Bible. <laughs> 
So she begs him. That's why Abram's going to fall for it. Go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. So this is the best thing that any wife would say. All right, I have, I have a maid right here. I want you to sleep with her, and then we can have children through her. How many women are going to raise their hand and say, that's the best idea? No one would. <laughs> yeah, some of you women are saying, shaking your heads and saying, yeah, right. You can tell this is one of the worst advice ever. Yeah. All right. The last part of verse 2, and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Like Adam, you can see a little bit of uh, human history. What men learn from history is that what? Men never learn from history. It's so important to see human, the pattern of human nature when you read the Bible. And when you combine that with history, like we did with the intermediate discipleship class, it becomes way more powerful. And then when you add that with today's current events, it becomes extremely powerful. And you realize, man, we're just stupid creatures. You can predict what will happen next year. You know how? Just look at history. That's it. Okay, so Abram listened to his wife. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So Abram was living 10 years in Canaan. And obviously, God gave a covenant, you're going to have children, but nothing happened. That would put any woman to fear. All right? Now, this is going to be the best part of the message here, both for men and women. I see this kind of pattern within families, too. This happens. Women, when you're waiting on the Lord and you know God's promises and you memorized it, but it's hard to wait and you get nervous and you want to get it over with, especially if there's a worry or a problem you're going through. You try 10 years. So Abram can't blame his poor wife. Probably Sarai was crying in tears. I can never have children again. We need to have children. Please go with my maid and then we can produce children. How can a man say no after that? Any pastor might even fall for that too. If you give it 10 years like that, that's why pastors might quit the ministry. Missionaries quit the mission field because it's been 10 years. And the wife is in tears and she's hurting real bad. What man will say no to a wife after that? All right, good preaching, amen. All right, let's keep reading here. All right, I'm going to show you the problems and how to take care of these problems, okay? So uh, Sarai, who is Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, who is an Egyptian, and then what? And gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. So gave Hagar to Abram so that Abram can take uh, Hagar as his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. So that's the English metaphor, meaning that uh, Abram was able to conceive seed with Hagar. He was intimate sexual with her, and they were able to bring forth a child. That's the meaning. And when she saw that she had conceived, so when Sarai saw that Hagar conceived seed was pregnant, all right, here's a typical church split and family squabbles that you see. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. So notice right here that Sarai was being disrespected. That's the idea with despised in Hagar's eyes. Because why? Look at me. I have a child. You don't. I'm better than you. Man, uh, if there's one thing a woman don't like is when they read between the lines and see another woman, you know, poking fun or disrespecting but in a subtle way, and the woman's the one that read between the lines, that's where an ugly fight comes out. And, and guess what? Look at verse 5. You can tell it's an ugly fight. Look how emotional she is. Look how angry she is. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. So that whatever I made a wrong decision about this, where you slept with Hagar, that's your fault, Okay. <laughs> How many husbands will, no, no, don't raise your hands, okay? That never happened to any of you husbands. No, it never happened. Don't raise your hands. Yeah. I have, I have given my maid into thy bosom. So 
uh, that's into thy bosom. That's an intimate thing, right? To, toward the side where they lean toward. So that's an intimate thing. You can tell that's sexual, intimate. Sarai saying, I've given my mate to your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. So when Hagar saw that, hey, I'm pregnant, then I was disrespected, despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. So see, God's going to punish you for that, Abram. God's going to judge in my place and punish you for doing that, for that stupid wrong decision you made. Now, what does a husband do after that? All right? A typical husband, this is generally what husbands do. But Abram said unto Sarai, it's all your fault. What are you talking about? Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. When a wife gets, so basically what that meant, how Abram responded to Sarai is, hey, look, that maid belongs to you. It's in your hands now. So it's your business. Do whatever you want to do. Do what pleases you. That's the idea. Now, this is a good passage that I want to park on for couples. This is the generation we live in today, is this passage. Now, what, uh, when you get into a situation like this, and couples get into this kind of troubling scenario, how do you solve it? Sometimes to the husband's mind, they're thinking, there's nothing to solve it, just leave it be, whatever. You know, let her rant and rave and just get angry. And then the woman's solution is, you hear me out, I'm going to scream and get angry. When you get like that, you get a wrecked up home. And that's what, exactly what the devil wants. And notice that this couple's fight is as legitimate and it is as specific and exact as our day and age. How does a fight like this start? When you get into, uh, when you get into couples' fights like this, and this does happen, when you get into like this, how do you solve this? Well, how does it start? If you went to the beginning, you would have resolved the issue. Right. It started out wrong. Now, listen up, guys, especially, you know, when you decide on a significant other to marry, both women and men. The problem with people today is they just give birth to children, they just get married without thinking without thinking the consequences that follow spiritually. You sooner think about your future, your economy, your money, your living situation more than spiritual life. That's your problem. That's why you ended up in this mess. And this is 99% of American families, what you're reading at Genesis 15. All right. Now, how does this start? It starts out, you have to resolve the beginning first. The beginning is is if you both trusted in the Lord and did what God told you to do. Right. It's that simple. If you did it that way, you wouldn't end up in this mess. Right. What are you going to do when you're at verse 6, guys? Look at verse 6. Look at verse 5 and 6. 5 and 6. Isn't that 99% of your life if you're a couple? If that is, that's sad. You could have prevented that 99% of the time. What is it? And then you waste time on therapy, psychological skills, and stuff like that. No, no, no. Just start from the beginning. You both trust God and do what he told you to do. Then this would e wouldn't even happen. No argument would even start. But sadly, we're just so wicked and weak in human nature that we always have to have an argument and then figure out a solution after the argument is made, not before. Yeah, amen. So that would have solved the problem if you went at the beginning. What was it? Sarai, I know you women have a legitimate reason, but I don't care if it's 10 years. You have to trust what God says and cannot go by your feeling or your thoughts or your worries. Stick in that mission field no matter how hard it is. Stick to that burden that God has given to you no matter how hard it is. No matter what the family problem is or the personal problem is, you need to trust God and not open your mouth. Once that mouth opens up in fear, and then, you, and then you plead with your husband, and have your husband do something that is not God's will, God's timing, then get ready for a fight later on. The women had to, uh, the women had to learn to 
shut their mouth and trust the Lord. What's the man's problem? The man's problem is you can't, you got to, you got to realize this is your responsibility. Notice that Sarai would not have given Hagar to Abram if Abram didn't make that final decision. Now, you men don't like to hear this, okay? Because I know you're a bunch of wimps nowadays and effeminate, all right? Yes, the responsibility is on your shoulders. The fault of the household is yours. Don't blame your wife. You always blame your wife, all right? No, she can't do something until you make the final decision. Whatever decision she makes, that's on you. So what you need to do is you need to take responsibility for your actions and, if it, and you need to stick by the Lord and say, no, we cannot do this because this is not right for the Lord. Once you cave in because of that crying tears, that emotional side, and you cave into that, game over. Because that's why Adam messed up the whole human race because of the, the pitiful side of Eve. She ate the fruit. And Adam wanted to die with her. Don't let that get you, man, because the devil knows your weak spot. That's right. The devil knows your weak spot where you love your wife, but that love is deceptive. That's not love. If you truly love her, you're going to do what's right. That's good. That's good. If you really love her. If you really love her, you're going to do what's right. And don't cave into that and just say, oh, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. You know, that's why you became effeminate. That's the majority of Americans. Like when problems happen, this is why we ended up with a socialist government. You know what? Oh, I don't know what to do. And it's easier to blame on the government and let them handle it. You take responsibility for your action. Bunch of sissy men nowadays. Now, here's the idea. We're going to look at 1 Peter 3. All right, so just do what's right. Then it would have been solved. Now, let's say because 90% of the time we're weak, we're stupid, we're evil, we don't solve it at the beginning. So God understands that, right? So let's say that we messed up at the beginning. The woman didn't, the woman didn't do her part. The man didn't do his part. Then what happens? An ugly argument happens to the point that the, the man wants to try to comfort the wife, try to resolve the situation, but let's say you get into a predicament and a situation, the argument is so out of hand where the woman is feeling so misunderstood, she's not being heard that well, she's not being uh, empathized as much, and then her emotions go at an outburst. And the man's, you know, the man, he's in his own plane, in his own brain and understanding, and then in his mind, he's thinking, there's no way to control this. I just relent and give up. What do you do at that point, right? Well, if you're flesh like Abram, do what you want. But Abram, he shouldn't have done that. Right, right. Well, I can't control my wife when she's ranting, raving, and all that kind of stuff. How am I going to do that? So then, this is what will be helpful. If you reach at that kind of an argument point, these are the following verses that will help you. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to do the men first and the women last, actually. That way it can be more understandable. All right, let's uh, hit on the men. At verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, the wives, what? According to knowledge. According to knowledge. You know one thing I realized about men who just uh, don't want to take responsibility anymore? They don't know a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know why? You've been too busy with your work, your video games, you, you, you. Right. You haven't spent a lot of time with your wife that you know her. If you really know her that well, you would know which way would appease her. Right. You would know her weaknesses or her touchy spots to avoid. Right. Right. But you don't really know her that well. That's why it's so important that you men, that you have a very strong bond with your wife, that you know her that well. That's good. You know how you lead? You know how you can get your woman to listen to you? When she knows that you know her very well. And, that, and on top of that, this is important. It's not just knowing her very well, because this is more important. You have to combine these two. If you don't combine these two, you're in trouble. The third one is 
giving honor unto the wife. You know what? This is very important. It's very easy for men to... When you're arguing with a woman and then you tell the woman that, hey, you, this is the worst part you'll say. I know you do this and this and this and see, you're doing that kind of stuff again. Then what, how does the wife feel? The wi oh, that's a big no-no to a woman. Then she feels judged. She feels belittled. She feels like, uh, oh, you think you know better than me. So then that makes her even more... Ah, at you. That's not helping the scenario. You, if you know her that well, at the same time, it has to appear like you're honoring her. You're not disrespecting her. Here, isn't this a wiser way to do it? Isn't it a wiser way to tell her that, hey, honey, remember this happened, be what you did before. Do you think God would approve of that? Don't say I approve it. Say God would approve of it. Right, right. See? Then you're making her think. The important thing is here is that one thing I've learned is this. You have to make them think with you. Yeah. It says dwell with them. Yeah. Dwell with them according to knowledge. You have to get them out of that emotional state and make them start thinking. Right. So ask them questions. Put them in a... Give them examples that where they can start thinking. It's very important you get them thinking. It's hard when they're in an emotional state. You have to start making them thinking, answer their own questions. That's good. And what happens is that calms down a lot. Yeah. All right, that's even psychological therapy. What they aim for is making you think, actually. Right. They try to make the client think. That way they can realize their problems is not really that bad of a problem, actually. But it's important that if you want to get them think with you, you don't disrespect them or they feel belittled. Like, yeah. you know, you're, I, you're treating me like a little child. How many women say that to the husband sometimes, right? I'm not your child. And, you know, that's why you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Number four, husbands, it says right here, as unto the what? Weaker vessel. Now, I don't care how discriminatory this is. This is actually very, very helpful to the women. All right, this is not discriminatory. This is actually helpful. The reason why you men argue so ferociously with her is because you think you're on an equal plane with her so that her thought pattern should follow your thought pattern. Can I tell you something stupid? All right, secular psychologists even realize the brain of a man functions differently from a brain of a woman. Okay? Because a woman, what she's, uh, I think the man, I could be interpreting this correctly, but you can study it yourself, that basically men, they have their own compartments with how they think. A woman, when she thinks of a thought, it connects. See that? So then, when you have, now I didn't say that, but <laughs> I think you're just made differently, all right? I am fearfully and wonderfully made, amen? <laughs> I'm trying to resolve, I'm trying to give peace to people here, all right? All right. So then the idea is that because women, they connect things together, men, they're the ones that divide the things. How can you men expect when you talk to the woman that she'll fall to follow your equal level? You know what the, the psychology world's doing? They're trying to create this, combine both brains together and make you follow their brain and their understanding. That's cuckoo. You're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, man. Yeah. The idea that you should be doing is le understand, hey, our brains are built differently, so we have to figure out a way how I can minister to a different mind. Yes. Right. Yes. All right, how are you going to do that? You understand she's a weaker vessel. What does that mean? What that means is, referring to a weaker vessel is because your mind pattern is built differently from a woman's mind pattern. Man, you got a lot of testosterone in you, so there's a lot more of that resistance, that power. Whereas the women, come on, let's be honest. It would be a shame for me to say that you're built 50%, 60% testosterone level, women. You're estrogen, okay? So because of that, it's, uh, it's not that... Uh, you're so pitiful and pathetic. No, you're just born differently. 
Now, did I offend some people that way? You're born created by God differently. That's all that it is. It doesn't make me better than you because if I was shot off with 80% estrogen, I'd probably cry along with you, okay? So the idea is that we have to understand that they're weaker than the men. Why? Because they have more estrogen. If you understand that, men, then you're going to be more patient and not think, why don't you get it? I'm so angry with you. They're not going to get it, all right? Unless you want to shoot them up with 50% testosterone, <laughs> then let's see how happy your marriage life is. <laughs> Let God create women the way they are and men they are. Right. Understanding differences, work it out now. That's what we live in a day and age. People don't want to work out differences. Now, that's the next thing. If you understand that, then you're not going to develop bitterness and frustration. You're going to know, look, they're different from me. And that's why you're going to understand when you have a three-year-old and you're going to be more patient with them. If you put them to your understanding, your level, you're nuts, man. Amen. See, everyone is built differently. So this is good for your husbands. You know why you get frustrated and you throw up your hands? Because you're so lazy and you think that everyone's like you. Yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. Good preaching right there. You men are pathetic, man. All right. Now, if we keep reading at the last part of verse 7, this will be eye-opening. And as being what? Heirs together of the grace of life. Now, that's important. You know what you would do, you wouldn't just jump the responsibility to the wife if you realized you're in this together. That's, good, brother. Yes. Amen. That's your problem. You think that it's going to be your wife's fault and your wife's responsibility, right? No, it's going to be both of you. Yeah. Trust me, especially when you have a, a rebel child, and then even if it's one parent at fault, that child will connect that second parent. Come on. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. How about that? I don't care what you say. Right. We live in a lazy pathetic, sissified generation who has zero accountability whatsoever. No wonder we're in this blame game of finding who to blame, who to blame. It's all Putin's fault. It's all Putin's fault, you know. When you got a person at the White House who just went like this to shake somebody's hand and nobody was over there. <laughs> but I don't know who's more stupid. I don't know who's more stupid. The man who went like this and nobody was uh, shaking his hand or the idiot who voted that guy in. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Now, you see, that's the generation we live in. It's your fault. You don't realize you're in this together. Right. You're in this together. Don't think it's because that person made the mistake. That's going to be that person's accountability. No, you together. Especially the man. You might say, why especially the man? Because he's in charge. Yeah. That's why the... the uh, that end game, that end result, that last decision is going to be yours to make. All right. Oh, my goodness. I'm past the time. Uh, I have to teach this. Otherwise, I'm going to lose it. Okay. Let me wrap it up here. Let me wrap it up here. Okay. So let's look at, now let's talk about the women. Let's talk about the women at verse 4 and 5. Now, women, what you need to do is this. This is hard for you. But this will help the argument. What's going to help the argument is the man already has enough on his plate, okay? <laughs> this is one thing you can do. But this one thing is hard. Come on. All right. That verse says, at verse 4, but let it be for the women, the what? Hidden man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and what? Quiet spirit. Verse 6, this is stronger. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him what? Lord. But in that case, she slipped up. And notice that big mess happened. But if she did her usual right thing of obeying Abraham, submitting to him, and shutting her mouth, that ugly thing wouldn't have happened. Women, this is hard for you, but you need to shut the mouth I'm sorry if this is offensive. Maybe I should say be quiet, all right? But, but I'll, I'll just... I was hard on the men, right? Yeah, okay. So let me do this once, okay? Come on. Say it like Dr. Ruffin. Say it like Dr. Ruffin. <laughs> Shut the mouth and what? 
This is hard for you women, especially with all that emotion and that pain. But you need, trust me, this is what you, this will help you. You need to zip it and listen. Then the art, and if the man will do his part, he's got enough on his plate, we can get somewhere in the argument. And then we can end it in probably 10 minutes rather than two hours for some of you. God forbid, some of you, some of you, some of you are like 10 years. All right. But think about this. The women, the men wouldn't have to do all this. The women wouldn't have to do these things. Oh, it's so hard. Why should I even do that? If you did this at the beginning. All right. So just do what God told you to do at the beginning. Trust God. Don't go by your timetable and just listen to him. All right. Don't do the pathetic route by least listening to fellow human. God, my Father, I pray that today's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers and will be helpful to apply in our lives, especially when people become married or people who are married but are struggling with this issue. And uh, we thank you so much for the beautiful pictures that we learned at Genesis 15. It's such an amazing book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.